know, let's get to our featured speaker today, Sarah Levin. And Sarah is founder of Secular Strategies, uh, a consulting firm that she started herself recently, pioneering the mobilization of secularist voters and empowering policymakers, lawmakers, and change makers to be effective champions of secularism in the United States. And this is a relatively new endeavor, and Sarah might mention that a little bit more for her. I don't know how long she's been doing it, but she used to work for the Secular Coalition for America, and that's how um, I and several others of us met her a few years ago when she was in the Twin Cities doing some speaking. And she's done various roles there, including Director of Grassroots and Community Programs and Director of Governmental Affairs. Um, she's recently gotten involved also in some partisan work in the Democratic Party, but trying to get um, the Democratic Party, as well as state affiliates of the Demo uh, uh, Democrats, um, to have secular caucuses. And so that's um, work that she's doing well, uh, doing as well. Um, she, she's wearing several hats. Um, Prior to joining the Secular Coalition, Sarah completed uh, her AmeriCorps service by serving low-income immigrant and refugee families as a bilingual community liaison at the Greenbrier Learning Center in Arlington, Virginia. And finally, uh, Sarah graduated um, with a bachelor's degree from American University. And while she was there, she was on the board of the university's Secular Student Alliance. So, uh, that's a little bit about Sarah. So without further ado, um, we are so pleased to have you here, Sarah. And on behalf of Humanist MN, a warm welcome to you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really great. It, it really feels like I'm coming back because I, I do remember that trip very fondly to Minnesota and I recognize uh, a lot of you. Some of you might recognize me. So it's really great to reconnect uh, without having to fly over. So, and um, thank you to all the out-of-staters out of also who are tuning in. So um, I decided not to do slides today. I'm going to keep it pretty um, casual and, and have uh, try to have some back and forth as well. So I want to kind of just start with um, talking about the, the threats and, you know, that we're facing in terms of church state separation, but also some of the opportunities we have. Um, and then I'm going to ask uh, you all a question. So I, I hope you're all ready to participate. Uh, so, you know, a lot of this is going to be uh, familiar to you all, but I think it's it's important to sort of remind ourselves some of why we do what we do and why it's so important for us to show up. So I want to start because it really you can't you can't not talk about January sixth. I mean, we knew about the threats that uh, over the last few decades the Christian right has been building and building uh, their political influence um, in uh, stacking the courts so many issues and and so we our community was already aware of the threat of christian nationalism far before january 6th but i think january 6th was really a, a key turning point in the sense that it was the first time that christian nationalism really was on the national stage in a way where mainstream media uh and and everyday americans you know seeing the the cross uh the 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 uh, Jesus save signs, the the prayer of the of the insurrectionists that they were saying in in the chambers as they were, you know, violating the the tenets of our democracy. It was so stark. It was so. It was something you just can't ignore. And for people who have been following Christian nationalism for a long time, it, it wasn't. It was shocking, but not surprising. Um, but one thing I noticed because I get uh, alerts on um, Christian nationalism because I try to sort of follow where the conversation is going, I started seeing the words Christian nationalisms in, in, in media outlets and coming from the mouths of people who, who never would have uttered those words before. Um, I can tell you from my partisan work that uh, when I was uh, submitting uh, recommendations to the DNC platform committee uh, in 2020 and uh, had, had the, the, I had some feedback from uh, faith allies and others. And the one thing that I was told I should take out of my draft was the words Christian nationalism, because it was seen as controversial. And, you know, you, sh you shouldn't say that, right? It's, you know, we get where you're coming from, but don't use those words. I, I can say that now after January 6th, I don't think that I would have gotten that response um, really just a few months later, because it's, it's something that people are starting to understand. 
Um, but it but it really is kind of the culmination of decades of of work by Christian nationalists. And so I want to talk about a few things uh, that we're seeing now that you, you all are probably aware of. But again, I think it's important to sort of ground ourselves in, in what are we facing here. So the Supreme Court is stacked by religious conservatives. We have uh, a case that's going to come out any a decision on uh, a case that's going to come out any day now that um, most of the experts I've heard from uh, who follow church state separation issues are really concerned that it's going to be a really, really bad decision and a huge blow to separation of church and state. Uh, so if you're not aware of it, I would read up on it. It's called Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. In a nutshell, without getting into the weeds, um, the question is whether, so the City of Philadelphia, like many municipalities, contracts with nonprofits, including faith-based uh, nonprofits and contractors to provide social services. And so in uh, their uh, child placement programs, um, they, they, they have a regulation that if you're receiving state funding, you're contracting with the city of Philadelphia, that you can't discriminate on the basis of religion and child placement. And when it was found that uh, uh, Christian agencies, I think it was uh, in this case, a Catholic one in particular, was uh, discriminating against LGBTQ couples, um, the city told them that they had to stop. They even offered an accommodation. And uh, the agency sued and the lower courts agreed uh, with the city, but it was taken up by the Supreme Court. And now we're waiting to see what the Supreme Court says. And what's at, the question here is basically whether faith-based nonprofits and contractors that are receiving state funding to provide services that are supposed to be available to all taxpaying citizens, all of us, um, whether we're LGBT or we're, we're interfaith couples or, you know, it's supposed to be for everybody, right? Just because it's not the government providing the service directly, the, the government is giving a contractor or nonprofit taxpayer dollars to provide that service. So the question at hand and what the uh, agency is saying is that they are not only should be exempt from that uh, regulation that they can't discriminate on the basis of religion, but that they should be entitled to the funding, entitled to those contracts. That's really what we've, and that's kind of emblematic of what we're seeing across the board. You know, you know the Christian nationalists uh, want their network of faith-based organizations to be able to have their cake and eat it too. They feel entitled to taxpayer dollars. Um, whether it's voucher schemes to fund their private religious schools, or it's uh, providing social services um, uh, to um, even, you know, public health and safety laws, right? They, they want the broadest possible religious exemptions um, from things that really don't target religion. They're just generally neutral laws. Um, but they also want access to state funding um, and to be able to discriminate using that taxpayer funding. And that's, that's really... Um, concerning in, uh, in the first place that the Supreme Court even took up the case, um, and it could turn out very badly for us. Um, so, and, and, you know, it's, 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 I don't, I don't say that to make you feel helpless in any kind of way, but the, the, the reality is that the courts are stacked to the point where it is going to take uh, at least another generation, if not longer, to, to fix that problem, because it's a 40 to 50 year, uh, path that the Christian right took to get to this point. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's not hope, right? We have, and, and you, you uh, uh, Mars and Christine talked a little bit about what we're seeing in state legislatures, in, you know, voter suppression, uh, a lot of bad bills. Uh, we're seeing churches really exploit the COVID crisis to get religious exemptions from public health emergency regulations and things like that. Um, so it, it's really, there's a lot to be concerned about. However, there are also great opportunities to turn the tide. And one of the most exciting ones that you're probably hearing a lot about is the demographic changes in the United States. So uh, the number is vary a lot, but anywhere from one in four to up to maybe even one in three Americans are religiously unaffiliated. And that is particularly strong among young people. So right now, um, and this is from a Gallup poll that came out uh, last month, 31% of millennials are religiously unaffiliated and 20% of uh, Generation X are, are unaffiliated. And Gen Z is, is also continuing that trend. 
Um, and this this uh, idea that young people just become re religious when they're older, that's, that's not actually the case. We have enough data to show that unaffiliated people are continuing to stay unaffiliated. There's more and more uh, secular uh, parenting happening, right? So there's this new generation of secular parents that are raising their children without religion. And I want to take a note real quick that when we say religiously unaffiliated, that doesn't mean non-theist. That is not the same. Religiously unaffiliated, that category encompasses a ton of people. It includes atheists and agnostics and humanists, but it also includes a lot of people who don't believe in God that don't use those labels. And it also includes a lot of believers that uh, are not affiliated with a specific religion and including people who may pray and, and go to church. So just keep in mind that, you know, religiously unaffiliated doesn't mean uh, non-theistic. It doesn't even necessarily always mean non-religious. It, it kind of depends how we define non-religious. Uh, but certainly these are folks who are not affiliated with a specific denomination. And it's important not to get caught up in that uh, issue of, okay, well, can we really claim the one in four if they're not all non-theists? I think what's really important to know about the religiously unaffiliated demographic is how um, they orient themselves on political issues uh, because they're remarkably united on a lot of big hot button issues. And I'm using data from like 2014. I haven't found you know an exact poll that's similar uh, since that one came out. But there was, there was a poll from Pew from the Religious Landscape Study, I think it was, um, that showed, it compared where the religiously unaffiliated were compared to other demographics on issues like abortion and whether or not businesses should be allowed to discriminate on the basis of religion and all of these things. And when I looked at where the unaffiliated were, remember that includes the from the atheist to the spiritual but not religious to the sort of unattached believer, where they compared to white evangelicals, we were even as a demographic more united on those issues, uh, for example, being vast majority in support of, of access to abortion in all or most cases than white evangelicals were. And if and I, that's pretty remarkable to me because when you think of white evangelicals and their agenda, you think about the big cultural issues, the culture war issues like repro reproductive rights and LGBTQ rights. Even on those issues, if you look at the religious stand affiliated, we're actually more united on those issues in support of, of more civil rights than the white evangelicals as a block are united against them. Um, so that's that's an opportunity uh, to, to think about. Um, but I really want to encourage you that I've heard, I think one of the most dangerous things that I've heard come from secular folks and humanists is this idea that, well, the country is becoming more secular and therefore our politics will follow suit, right? That that's just going to naturally occur on its own. That is absolutely not the case. And it's an excuse for complacency, it's an excuse for apathy. And it, it's just, it doesn't bear out in evidence. You can look today at a number of different policy areas where the majority of Americans are here on an issue, but the policy is completely different, right? You, can, you have uh, huge demographic groups that are, have little to no uh, influence. And then you have very small groups, uh, interest groups that are very well organized that have outsized influence, disproportionate influence compared to how much they make up the public. So just because we're expected to just see this continuation of exponential growth for non-religious Americans doesn't mean that's gonna change the politics. Um, if we don't organize around those shared values um, and operate as, as more of a voting block, as more of a cohesive group of people with an agenda, then you know that, that's just not gonna happen on its own. I think that's really important to recognize that that is an opportunity, but demographics are not destiny. You have to actually harness that opportunity. Um, so that's just kind of, you know, a start, right? So, and I, I do want to make sure that I talk a little bit about the, what, what we advertise, right? Because one of the things I talked about with Audrey, um, that I think might be of interest to your group is, um, what, what does it look like in today's politics to be a relevant and active group? And I have to say, you know, a lot of the things that Marcy and Christine talked about are things that I advise other groups to do. So you all are very well ahead of a lot of local secular groups in terms of being organized, um, being um, intersectional in the way you view things. And I'm going to, going to talk a little bit about that. So, you know, some of the things I'm advising you might already be doing, and maybe it's just a matter of scaling what you're doing um, or, or um, 
you know, getting the word out to other groups. So I apologize if I'm telling you to do things you're already doing because you're, you're actually in, in fantastic shape in a lot of ways. Um, but I, I want to talk a little bit about intersectionality um, and because and, I think that's a huge part of today's politics. And um, I've noticed uh, coming from DC where I was involved in a lot of different nonprofit coalitions, had friends who worked in different social justice spaces. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a buzzword, but I do think it's important to understand um, why intersectionality is important for the secular community. Um, and I did, I, I, I wanted to uh, find at least some working definition, so I googled it so that we have a, you know, I, you probably all already know this, but this is, this is one definition out there of intersectionality. It's the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and inter interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. So the reason I want to talk a little bit about intersectionality is because I've, I, I've noticed that th there's a tension right now with um, a lot of local secular and humanist groups about whether or not they should be working on issues that are quote, not church state separation issues. So actually what I want, my first question I want to ask to all of you is, what are church state separation issues? What do you think it, you know, just put them in the chat. Like what are church state separation issues? How do you define it or put a list? I'm just really curious to see how you all think about what church state separation is in terms of issues. I'll just wait for everyone to join. Um, I, Audrey, do you want me to take questions? I don't mind taking questions during, um, but I, I generally do Q and A at the end. Unless it's really pertinent, try to do your, hold your questions, but you can put them in the chat if you want to say. Okay. That. Yeah. If you could, if you have a question that might be relevant to what I'm saying now, I, I am following the chat. So please put it there. Government funding of church activities and education. Yep. What else are church state separation issues? Don't let George be the only one to share. Here we go. Suppression of science and evidence-based practice. Okay. A time when the DFL president does not appeal to God at the end of his speech. Yeah. Religious influence on public policy like abortion, medical aid and dying. Mm -hmm. This is great. So, I really want to highlight what Christine said here, um, that church state separation borders on many things, how you treat the environment, care for low income folks and reproductive rights. Because I think in the past, the secular movement and humanist movement as a whole was really trying to focus just on where we religion intrudes and we in, in a very sort of direct, obvious way and we respond. And if there wasn't, if religion wasn't really obviously and directly involved, then it's not a church state separation issue. And what I like to tell people is, first of all, church state separation is not an issue. It's a constitutional principle that incorporates like dozens of different issues, right? Um, and I think for a long time, it was especially uh, focused, uh, you know, church state separation, separation issues were thought of as uh, what I call sort of the bread and butter stuff, things like um, religious displays on government property, uh, you know, public uh, elected officials invoking God and religion and those sorts of things. And those are absolutely uh, very obviously church state separation issues. But I think what Christine is getting at here is that in today's political climate and the way that our discourse is going, we really need to understand how beyond the really obvious, right? Because we're talking about things as systemic problems. Um, the conversation about racial injustice, the conversations about um, um, women's rights and gender equality, the conversations around income inequality, they're about systems. There's a, it, it's, it's understanding what are the, beyond the specific instances uh, or specific individuals, what are the systems that are the root causes that are creating these problems? And they're often very complex and overlapping with other things. And there's a lot of things that are church state separation issues that aren't necessarily obvious when they, you know, that when, it, when you first look at it, you don't think church state separation. Um, so I think for, for a long time, I would talk to groups about, you know, advocating for, and I still would advocate for this, but, but 
I, I think that this, instead of it being a one-way street, it has to be a two-way street. One of, the, one of the problems I see is that church state separation issues are not considered part of, they're not really part of the social justice framework right now. The folks who think of themselves as working for social justice, you don't often enough hear them talk about the separation of church and state as they relate to social justice issues like racial justice and, and reproductive rights and LGBTQ rights and the climate uh, and healthcare and income inequality. You don't hear them talk about how religion is impacting those issues. But vice versa, our community needs to be talking about how our issues, how separation of church and state is impacting those issues. We need to both be educating and advocating to our allies that they incorporate church state separation into the social justice framework, but we also need to incorporate other issues into our framework of church state separation because you can't just um, you know, expect to get and not give, right? But it, it's also not just a, there, there's one way to, there's two ways to think about it. One is just from a strategic standpoint of if you wanna have strong allies that show up for you, you have to show up for your allies. But it's not just a strategic thing. It's actually, if we really wanna understand the impact of religion on our culture, on our laws, on our courts. We have to understand beyond what we have typically in the past as a movement thought of as uh, church state separation issues. Um, and again, that's not to say that things like prayer in public schools or government funding of religious organizations or elected officials invoking God aren't important and aren't church state separation issues. But the tension point that I mentioned earlier is I've seen a lot of local groups be very resistant to going anything beyond that. Um, they don't want to talk about race. They don't want to talk about, and, and actually, you know, this was before my time, but folks who were involved in the secular movement a lot longer than I have have told me that it was a struggle for the secular, national secular organizations to start talking about abortion and reproductive rights as a church state separation issue. It hasn't always been the case that, you know, broadly speaking, national secular organizations were talking about that, which now looking back, it's, it's like, well, how could they not have? It's so obviously coming from the Christian right. It's a imposition of a very specific religious conservative point of view about where life begins and all of that. But for a long time, that was not necessarily that that was a tension point and i think now there's a new set of issues uh whether it be trans issues or racial justice where there's resistance and and part of the resistance is the question well or the assertion that well these aren't these are important but they're not our issues these are not church state separation issues um and i would argue that they absolutely are and and if you take an intersectional approach to understanding the world you will soon see how church state separation impacts all of these other issues, how religion and its impact on our culture impacts these issues. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of this. Um, do I have the link here? So here's um, a great resource. If you haven't heard of it, this is National Coalition for Public Education, which does have secular organ, oops, sorry, that's two of them. But that first link is the National Coalition for Public Education. They basically oppose vouchers and all voucher schemes. Uh, which divert public funds uh, for public schools to private religious schools. Um, and the vast majority of the funding for the private schools ends up in religious and sectarian schools. And the link I put there has studies that show that vouchers uh, have been, uh, the evidence shows that voucher schemes uh, tend to reinforce racial segregation. And actually what I've learned in, in, in recent years is that the entire, uh, you know, private school industry has roots in, in, in anti-integration, um, in integrationists, right? So there is an actual direct link between today's, uh, you know, privatization, the movement for school choice, the privatization of schools has a racist past um, that, you know, it was anti-integration, uh, it, was, it was segregationists who were trying to maintain their all white schools that are really at the root of what we see today in terms of privatization of public education. And so think about for a second, um, if you're a secular group and you're limiting your messaging and you're limiting the way that you think about government funding of religion to, we're only gonna talk about how 
public funding is going to private religious schools and we're not going to address sort of anything beyond that. Well, you're missing the opportunity then to talk to racial justice groups about how this is a racial justice issue that not only is government funding going to private religious schools that teach that don't have to teach a secular curriculum that might be teaching a discriminatory uh, ideas that will not necessarily, uh, um, that has discriminatory practices, won't accept LGBTQ students, won't necessarily um, accommodate students with disabilities because they don't have to, like public schools do. There's all of those issues. But not only that, but how they reinforce systemic racism. And if we understand that, we can talk to our allies about it and, and have them understand why it's important to us and why the issue should be important to them. Right. Um, so we'll miss that opportunity if we are going to be so narrow minded of, well, if it doesn't have to do directly with religion, then I'm not going to deal with it. Then it's not true state separation. I think that's a that's too narrow of a way to to think about these issues and, and you miss opportunities. The second link there is from uh, the Americans United for Separation of Church and State blog. And it's about how the big Christian right organizations like the Family Research Council and the Alliance Defending Freedom are backing voter suppression bills. Um, and that's not an accident, right? Because it is in their interest to make sure that not everyone can vote because they know that their base, which is very white, very Christian, very aging, um, is, is, is going to be, is not the majority, is, is not going to be, um, uh, is, is, is shrinking in size, right? And they are losing a lot of, uh, on some of these culture war issues that they're waging. And they knew a long time ago that the demographics were not in their favor, which is why they focus so much on codifying their beliefs and law as much as possible, stacking the courts and doing all of these things, right? So in the past, and I'm really glad to hear that your group is actually really thinking intersectional, uh, intersectionally because you have your social action group working on these issues. Um, I think it's really important to connect the dots here because it's not just that it's the right thing to do and as from an ethical humanist perspective, we should be concerned about democracy. That's absolutely true, but we can even strengthen um, the understanding of our, that our allies have of these issues by Talk, understanding ourselves why why these things are connected. Why is it that the Christian right is behind, is backing voter suppression? Why does it benefit them? Um, who who are they in coalition with that um, that are pushing systemic inequalities? And how can we talk to our allies about that? And how can we better understand those connections? So that's what I mean by intersectionality. Um, I think with I think that's a huge part of today's politics. And if we want to stay relevant as a community. Um, as activists, we need to be thinking that way. We need to be messaging that way. Um, so I wanted to ask you all another question, uh, which is, you know, we have this great opportunity. We have, a, we're, we're the largest, fastest growing religious demographic, um, the religious land affiliated that is. Um, so my question to you is, why do you think that we are underrepresented in government? Why is it that we don't have more political influence that we currently have. Why is that happening? You could share that in the chat. Fear, okay. Stigma to non-belief, yep. Stigma for politicians who say they aren't religious. Yep, someone said, I suspect some representatives are unaffiliated, yes. Um, other reasons. Mm -hmm. Pass laws that say explicitly we can't hold office. Okay. Yeah, there's still um, eight con state constitutions that have a uh, religious test for public office. They are not constitutionally enforceable. So they are basically, uh, they're, they're still on the books though, right? They, there hasn't been an effort uh, to like in places like Texas to actually strike that language from the state constitutions, but it isn't actually enforceable law, but it says a lot that they're still on the books. Any other reasons why we don't have more political influence or representation? People conflate religion with morality and associate, yep. Mm -hmm. So there's a few things I, uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that you all shared. Um, and then I want to bring up some things that nobody actually uh, proposed here. So uh, I'll start with fear. Um, I assume you mean um, 
fear of non-religious people or, or maybe fear of you know cultural changes um so i think that that's definitely um a, a factor uh, i think stigma to being non-religious is is still very much a factor and it's something that um there's still not a lot of understanding about there there's not really an acknowledgement that that is a uh uh, that the stigma is there and there's not yet enough political will to actually do anything about it. But I do have some, um, uh, we are making some progress that I'll be happy to share. Um, and it's all kind of related, right? The, the other side of the coin of the stigma is this, uh, what, when, when you say people conflating religion with morality, um, that to me, I think it, kind of encapsulates religious privilege is what I call it, right? The kind of assumption, the benefit of the doubt that religious people or people who, you know, uh, wear their faith on their sleeve get, that they get, that there's an assumption that they're good people, right? And, and even, even when there's evidence to the contrary, right? That they get away with a lot of things um, while non-religious people who are showing their values, their positive values still have to prove themselves, right? That's, that's an, uh, one way of talking about religious privilege. So I think that's, definitely part of it. Um, so secularist vote is taken for granted by Democrats. We have no alternative to them. Okay. So yeah. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to address a few of these. So first of all, someone mentioned the age of the, uh, that younger people uh, make up a large part of the unaffiliated. That is a huge part of it. That's what I was, I was hoping someone would talk about voters and voter turnout. So um, things are getting better. And I think we're, we're still waiting to get the full analysis of what happened in 2020. But for a long time, the uh, voter turnout of the unaffiliated was just plateauing at 12%. I believe it's 2018, it went to 17%. And um, it seems... Uh, the, the, the data we have so far seems to point to a very high turnout rate in 2020. But, you know, that's something to celebrate among the unaffiliated. However, you know, 2020 was a very special election in that there were a lot of people voting against Trump. I would argue that science being on the ballot was a huge motivator for non-religious people. Uh, just, you know, uh, so I, I don't think we should necessarily, even if we have great numbers of turnout for unaffiliated people in uh, 2020, we shouldn't necessarily expect that to be replicated um, in every presidential election. And of course, that's not the only election there is, right? There's midterms of local and all of that. Um, the age uh, is a huge part of it, right? The overlapping issues of why young people don't vote um, in high numbers is, 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 is the same challenge that the unaffiliated have to face because so much of our voters are younger. Um, and so we need to make sure any, any effort to engage young voters is really also an effort to engage unaffiliated voters. Um, so that's a huge part of it. Um, and someone else touched on the other issue is, you know, secular folks are not organized together enough um, and that the party takes us for granted. So one of the things I do in my partisan work, and, and this is a nonpartisan organization, so you can apply everything that I'm talking about to whatever party you're affiliated with. Um, but the interesting thing is, Atheists and atheists. First of all, there's a there's a study that showed that atheists are some of the most uh, involved, uh, politically involved, um, active uh, people in the country, um, and they're they're the most they're liberal. They consider themselves left of the Democratic Party. Agnostics a, a little bit less so, and then nothing in particular. So is a much larger group that is that fluctuates, right? So um, it's important to note that while as a whole the un the religious and affiliated overwhelmingly vote Democrat. Um, not all of them do. There is a sizable amount of them that are not registered Democrats, that are independents, and a lot of unaffiliated people voted third party in 2016, voted for Libertarians, voted for Greens, and of course there is also a chunk of um, uh, unaffiliated who are conservative and who vote Republican. Um, overall, of course, the majority vote uh, Democrat, but you know, I think part of, part of my work uh, in the partisan sphere is um, educating Democrats um, about non-religious voters, because understanding that uh, non-religious voters is one step toward being courted, right? Because there are huge opportunities for the Democratic Party to win over the non-religious vote, um, because the, the idea that we can be taken for granted um, ignores the fact that there's a sizable amount that don't, won't always vote Democrat, and that can be swung to a different party, including third parties. Um, early analysis by a 
uh, Ryan Burge, uh, who just wrote a book on the nuns, uh, is saying that the, the switch of people who voted, non-religious people, sorry, unaffiliated people who voted third party in 2016, who then voted Democrat in 2020, might have made the difference, uh, made a huge difference, right? So we can't actually, first of all, assume that all non-religious people vote Democrat. But absolutely, I would say the attitude that we can be taken for granted is absolutely there. So how do we, how do we change that? One of the things that I advocate for you all to do, right, is that you're all involved in this nonprofit, right, in, in Humanist MN, which is uh, nonpartisan and, and can't, you know, uh, can do a lot of things around advocacy, even lobbying, uh, but can't endorse or oppose a candidate, right? But I imagine a lot of you, or at least some of you, are involved in, your, in a political party. And one of the things that's happening that's a real problem for religious and secular people is that we are actually really active in things. We, this idea that we're not joiners, that we don't do things, I think is total BS. Um, and it's something we've internalized, but isn't actually true. But what is true is that we join political parties, we donate to candidates, we volunteer on campaigns, we join our local food bank, we do all kinds of things, but we don't do it as secular people. We don't bring our secular identity into every single aspect of our lives. A lot of us, only bring it into communities like this. And then a huge amount of uh, probably the majority of people who are religiously unaffiliated aren't involved in groups like this at all. Um, and so that, that one thing I'm doing with Secular Democrats of America, which is one of my clients, is creating space for people to merge those identities. Because it's not like secular people aren't involved in the Democratic Party. In fact, I think about a third of the Democratic Party of registered Democrats are non-religious but they're not wearing it on their sleeve. They're not organizing that way. And so when they donate to a candidate, there's no indication on that check, on that act blue donation, that it came from an atheist, right? Um, there's, there's no way to, uh, for people to, to communicate that, you know, all the people who showed up to Canvas today, you know, uh, 10 of this group of 30 people are secular, right? And so creating that space has actually been really successful because first of all, um, uh, we draw from two places. There are people like, like you all who are involved in humanist and atheist groups who happen to also be a Democrat. And again, I'm using a Democrat, Democrats as an example, but you can apply this to any political party. So they, so they say, oh, I'm also involved in the Democratic Party. So yeah, I want to, I want to be involved as a secular Democrat in my state Democratic Party. But there's another pool of people, people who are Democrats or whatever political party who also happen to identify as secular, but may not be involved in groups like this. They may not even know that these groups exist. And I can tell you because I have had these conversations. I just spoke to someone who's a donor to Secular Democrats uh, recently in South Carolina, who, first of all, became an atheist just in recent years and was not aware, uh, I mean, probably most of you at this point have heard of Herb Silverman, right? This guy lives in Charleston and he didn't know who Herb Silverman was. He didn't know that there were secular groups in his area. And who knows, maybe if an, even if he did, uh, you know, he has young kids, he may not have had time or been interested. In, not everyone is interested uh, or ha is in a pl place in their life to join a group like this. You know, they're, they're doing other things on their Saturday, right? Um, and that, that's okay, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a way for them to be active as a secular person. There just has to be a space for it. And so that's where we're drawing people as well as people who their number one thing or the, the, where they put the most volunteer time is with the party, but they're also secular. And so what happens is when we have these secular caucuses or we have events for secular Democrats, people come out of the woodwork, both from the secular community and from the democratic community. And it gives people the opportunity to donate to a candidate, donate to a race, donate to the party as secular Dems, to phone bank as secular Dems, so that we get the credit, we get the visibility for frankly things that our community is already doing, but not doing together. Um, and a lot of people really just, it, it's kind of like you, you can, if you, if you don't know that something exists, how can you even search for it, right? You know, if you're Googling something, you, you have an idea of what you're looking for, but if you've never even heard of something, like you're never gonna look for it. Uh, so so we, we are providing that space. So what, that's just one way, it's not the only way. There's a lot of ways that we can change this dynamic where we're growing and growing and growing in numbers, but not getting the uh, representation. 
one very important way to do it is to bring your secular identity into your political party. And why? Because first of all, uh, money and people power are huge, have a huge impact on who gets elected to office. Um, and, and the political parties play a huge role in, um, in who runs as a candidate, right? Um, and there are probably scenarios where you have the party maybe picking one favorite, but maybe there's an underdog atheist who's running for office and who's gonna support them, right? We actually already have a growing network of elected officials who are openly non-religious. I'm gonna put this in the chat right here. Um, there's a new organization called the Association of Secular Elected Officials that was founded by Leonard Pressburg, who's an atheist uh, school board member in Fayetteville, Georgia. And he started this to, to start providing resources and networking elected officials from the very local level to the state and federal level all across uh, the country um, and working with uh, sec groups like Secular Democrats, um, they're able uh, to, to connect, right? So if you have fantastic elected officials, say something like someone like Representative Athena Solomon in Arizona, who is dynamite and amazing and a great representation of the secular community. Well, how are we supporting someone like her? What happens when she runs for re-election? Um, do we have a group of people who are ready to show up and say, I'm a secular Democrat and I'm knocking doors for Athena. I'm raising money. I'm giving money to Athena. Uh, you know, we have to build those structures. We have to build those institutions. Um, and, and political parties are just one way of doing that. But if you think about bringing your secular identity to everything you do, into the ser social services that you're involved in, you know, the volunteer work, into your political partisan political life into your uh, into groups like this, obviously, but there's so many other ways that you can bring your secular identity um, in and that that helps with the cohesion, because again, the idea like oh secular people aren't organized. Yes, but it's, it's more that we're not cohesively organized and identifying each other as having a shared values and shared agendas. It's not that we're not involved. We're just not necessarily involved in, in that way where we're merging our secular identity with those other things. Um, so um, with that, um, let me just check on the time. I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, actually I'm gonna say one more thing about this. Uh, I really loved hearing about the great work you guys are doing with um, the Second Chance Program, the Free Bites for Kids, because um, one thing that I think is gonna be important for the secular community and the humanist community to think about long-term is, especially if we get in a place where, because of the Supreme Court decisions like Fulton, where basically the gov governments are, if we get to a place where governments are not allowed legally to say to contractors that you can't contract with our city, contract with our state, if you discriminate, if they are going to be forced by the courts to treat them to treat discriminating agencies and non-discriminating agencies the same, there's going to be a huge problem, right? Where, and I think this is something that the general public is still not understanding as a problem. Of, and, 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 it's, and it's not just foster care and adoption agencies, it's hospital mergers, right? If you, uh, This is another resource if you're not aware of this issue, and it would be worth seeing um, what uh, is going on in Minnesota with this. Uh, I think it's mergerwatch.org. Um, we have this huge problem where uh, religiously affiliated providers are merging and, and acquiring secular providers, and those um, they are operating under ethical and religious directives. So there are certain services that they will not and do not provide. And so, you know, they, you might be going to a provider that doesn't even have uh, any sort of indication that it's religious, and it might not be, it might just be under the umbrella of a broader religious network, that uh, religious provider that has uh, uh, incorporated it, and they will not do certain things like prescribe birth control or give you an abortion or in, in more dire situations where you have an unviable fetus and a woman experiencing a, a, a life-threatening um, you know, uh, miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy, all, the, all of these sort of uh, scenarios, there are horrific stories of women being sent home and sent home and sent home, bleeding out, um, because what they needed was uh, a, an abortion, uh, an induced abortion. They didn't have a viable fetus at that point, but because the hospital that they were going to 
uh, was operating under religious directives, they were sent home and, and nearly died, right? This is just one of many issues where we have um, religious organizations um, providing services, public services, um, and, uh, and then discriminating on the basis of religion or imposing their religious beliefs on people's health care and all that sort of stuff. You guys are very well aware of uh, medical aid and dying having uh, this issue with religious opposition uh, and imposing their beliefs about, you know, end of life on, on the choices of everyone who has a terminal illness. Um, of six months or less to live in Minnesota, right? You know, their, their arguments are all coming from that perspective. So that's a very, there's a bit of a digression, but the, re the, the, the reason I bring it up is that, first of all, one of the things uh, that came out uh, in that Gallup poll that, that got captured headlines was that for the first time, less than 50% of Americans are attending uh, houses of worship. And it got all these headlines. I had uh, one reporter, uh, or not, it was uh, someone, someone that I uh, knew in the interfaith space, you know, reached out to me asking what I thought about this. And for me, I'm like, well, this is just continuation of a trend for a long time. We're just under 50% for the first time. But one of the things that I hear a lot from sort of pundits and religious people just is, well, gosh, if this is the trend, what's going to happen to social services? People are afraid uh, and about, you know, what's going to happen when houses of worship are no longer providing essential services that a lot of them do. Um, and they don't see the secular humanist community. They're asking what's going to replace it. And basically saying that there's nothing that's going to replace it. Now, depending on your political orientation, um, some people might say, well, gosh, the government should be providing those services. They shouldn't be farming it out or depending on nonprofits and houses of worship to provide them. That's one perspective. But another thing to think about is, you know, shouldn't humanists be on the forefront of replacing those services, you know? Um, and that's why I think it's actually really important it's, it's not just about living our humanist values as an individual. I think it's, that's really important for groups like this to provide individuals the opportunity to volunteer and make a difference. But it's actually bigger picture than that. We really should think about how can the humanist community actually replace the kinds of social services um, that uh, religious organizations have. And that's a massive task. I mean, we're talking about massive, massive, I mean, think about Catholic charities and these are huge. But what I would really love to see, I would love to see humanists opening the uh, humanist equivalent of a, of a Salvation Army, opening daycare centers, opening um, all kinds of things that you think about when you think about well, what are the kinds of services that people are so afraid are going to go away that actually might go away as people, uh, you know, attend churches less. Can we replace them? Aren't we well positioned to do that from a humanist perspective? Um, that's something I want to put out there as, as thinking about the future, right? Our political, you know, our, our cultural climate, not just our, pol our, our political climate is changing. Young people are not, part of what's driving this decrease in participation is young people. Young people don't want to go and sit in a church on Sunday, right? But that doesn't mean that they don't want community. It's just that community has to look different. And this is one other thing I wanted to talk about here because in the, you know, I want to deliver what I promised, which is a partly to talk about this aging out problem that we have with local groups. Um, it's a serious problem, right? Because if you're not recruiting young people to your group, you're, you're, you're not, you know, you don't have longevity. You know, what's going to be, uh, if you don't have people uh, in leadership and, and members who are going to become the new board members, you know, in a few years, you will age out, right? And we don't want that. These are really, you're doing really important work. You want to make sure that Humanist Minnesota continues. Um, if you haven't yet, uh, and maybe you have, uh, Secular Student Alliance has a whole presentation on this specifically tailored to groups about how they can how they can uh, work with young people. Uh, so I'm not going to, you know, uh, get too much into it, but I will mention a few things. Um, which is that you do have to be aware that young people don't want to, in person or online like this, they don't want to attend a lecture, right? There's a very a certain amount of, or so there's a there's a certain structure that a lot of groups have had for a very long time, worked until a point, right? And now there's a realization like, gosh, you know, so many local atheists and humanist groups, you know, the, the youngest person is in their 50s, right? I've, I've seen that. Uh, myself. And I've had those folks, you know, say to me, like, this is a problem and we're not sure how to fix it. Um, 
And one thing that I think is important from the presentation that I've seen Psycho Student Alliance do is realizing that it's not, it's not enough to just invite young people to your events, right? You have to show up for them. You have to meet, meet them where they are, uh, find out what their needs are, um, and think about the kinds of programs that would be interesting, that wouldn't be interesting to you, but would be interesting to them. Right, and, and, and it really comes down to, are you willing to change, right? If you're concerned, if you're a humanist group that's worried about aging out and you really are saying, okay, it's one of our goals to uh, diversify our age and, and race and all these other things, you have to, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't say that you want to have those, uh, you know, that you want to do things that will have that result, but then not be willing to change, right? It's perfectly okay to say, you know what, we just don't want to change. We don't, you know, it'd be nice to have uh, younger people and, and more diversity, but you know what, you know, we just really like doing things the way we've done it. That's fine. As long as you're, you're aware that you may not grow, that there may not be longevity, if that suits your purposes, then fine. But you can't say you want these things and then not be willing to be a little bit uncomfortable, to be outside of your comfort zone, to do things that are very different than you've done in the past. Um, and so um, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, and I'm not going to go too much more into it because there's a whole presentation you should ask Cyclo Student Alliance for around this issue. But I do think that what I mentioned earlier about intersectionality is a huge part of it. Um, and the reason I talked about sort of, uh, you know, the, that issue is because I do think that given the political leanings and the way that young secular people tend to think, um, especially sort of more on the, on the liberal side, um, it's not really acceptable anymore for, 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 from their perspective to have humanist groups be silent on major issues that just because it's not considered church state, right? Um, one of the things to keep in mind, um, especially um, if, if you've been involved in the secular community for a long time and are sort of aware of kind of the different stages, you know, we're, we're in a place where there's still absolutely stigma. Absolutely, for being non-religious, but it's definitely not as bad as it used to be. I, you're, you're, uh, I'll bet a bunch of you have heard about this whole Gallup poll about, you know, whether you would vote for an atheist for president. It's now over 50%. I think it's 60% of Americans would vote for an atheist for president. Still means 40% wouldn't, but it used to be under 50%, well below that, right? So we are seeing that change. It is easier today to be openly non-religious than it used to be, especially if you are a young person because you're growing uh, again, depending on where you are, this is not universal. This is a very overall trend um, that does not in any way negate that the real stigma that we still have and have to fight. Um, but if you think about it, that's a great thing. But what does that mean? If I'm, you know, and I'll take myself as a young person who uh, lived in metropolitan areas like DC and Philly, I never had to, you know, I, I'm not, I've never lived in a place like Alabama. I never had to pay a high social cost for being an atheist. What that means is that my needs are very different than someone who really had to struggle to just be openly who they are, which means that my interests are going to be, are not really going to be about discussing religion and, um, you know, talking about sort of these, you know, bread and butter issues. I'm going to be more interested in other things um, because my basic needs of just being openly who I am, that's just not a factor. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. But, it, but if you are someone that, that went through that or continues to go through that, of, of, you know, your identity as an atheist or humanist being very important to you, just recognize that for a lot of young people, the identity factor is just not as important. And part of it is actually because we have the privilege of growing up in a slightly more uh, uh, welcoming environment than maybe you grew up in, right? Um, but that does mean the priorities are different. It means we see the world differently. And again, that's not a bad thing, but it does mean that you might have to take a different approach. So if you are a humanist group and you are not, um, putting out statements uh, and, and taking a stand on issues like racial justice, on issues like income inequality, on issues like um, uh, trans rights and LGBT rights. Um, the, in my opinion, the current generation really sees that as, as uh, you're, it's not neutral. It's not staying in your lane. It's, it's failing to be humanist. It's failing to see the world the way that they see it. Uh, and I have talked to a lot of young people and, 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 people of, uh, and heard from people of color and women who do not feel welcome in atheist and humanist spaces because they're told, nope, 
That issue is not what we're here about. We're here to talk about church state separation, right? And that's why I asked that question earlier because there's a very, in some groups, I'm not saying this one, um, there's a very narrow view of what church state separation actually means. Um, I think really leaning into that section intersectionality is actually a great way to attract younger people and diverse people. And, and one last thing I wanna say on that is that often when I bring this up, the, the question then is, well, we can't do everything, right? And we don't wanna you know, impose ourselves and, and, and lead on issues that we're not experts in, right? Um, and we don't wanna stretch ourselves too thin. We're already trying to do so many things. Well, there's a lot of ways that you can show up without you know, being the lead, right? You know, following organizations, joining coalitions, putting out statements, just, just putting out statements, although it can feel very performative sometimes and you do have to be careful that it's not performative. It's important to make very clear to the outside world, Minnesota, this is where we stand on these issues, uh, right? Because again, if we're trying to show uh, humanist values and ethics, uh, we need to show where we stand on these issues and neutrality is really just not acceptable in today's uh, political climate. And I know there's a concern that, well, gosh, there's some people who aren't comfortable with us taking a stand on these issues because they're not church state separation or because they don't agree. I would argue that whoever you're gonna lose for putting out a statement that Black Lives Matter um, as a humanist group, you're gonna gain so much more or have so much opportunity to gain people that wouldn't otherwise associate with you, then you're gonna lose, um, especially if you want to be relevant in um, today's political climate. Um, so I'm just gonna check my list here and see if there's anything I missed that I wanted to share. Um, this is just an example. Um, this is not, uh, this is just an example of kind of intersectionality at play. Um, this is a Center for American Progress, very left leaning, but I just thought this was a good example of, so this five ways immigration justice uh, impacts reproductive justice, right? This is what you can, if what I would advise you to think about is how can I, that list we put together earlier of like, what are church state separation issues, the kind of broader ones. Uh, and I think Christine mentioned income inequality. Think about how you would explain why income inequality is a church state separation issue. Why government funding of private religious schools and vouchers and school choice are church state separation and racial justice issue, right? How would you explain that in a nutshell, like this article does for immigration and reproductive justice to allies, to other people? Right, um, because it's under before we educate others and talk to our allies about incorporating our issues and all of that, we have to understand it ourselves. And this is this is often very complex, and it takes some work. Um, so I would also recommend uh, two books that I have read recently that really helped me with my thinking around this. One is called uh, "White Christian Privilege" by Kyati Joshi, who is a Hindu American woman um, and very sought after scholar. And the other uh, that you've probably heard of, I hope at this point, is Power Worshippers um, by Catherine Stewart, who also wrote the book that exposed uh, the Good News Club, which is the after school program that evangelicals uh, have started up in all, all around the country that seeks to proselytize to children um, and, and really undermine uh, public school systems. These are really great ways of understanding because power worshipers does a great job of just chronicling all of the uh, co political coalitions and all the different players. And you start to see very plainly how, uh, you know, economic libertarians and the Christian right and, uh, and, and, and uh, frankly, uh, racists all sort of have this interplay of interests and in how they worked together. Um, so this intersection has become very clear and it's the same with uh, white Christian privilege, which really gets at all of making sort of the invisible systems more visible. Um, okay, so I think I think that is mostly all I wanted to share with you today. I really wanna make sure I have plenty of time for Q and A and it doesn't seem like I left a whole lot of time. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, and I, I wanna also recognize again that a lot of things I'm talking about based on what I've heard today, you guys are already doing. So I wanna really like thank you for that because I think it's very much a model uh, for other groups. Um, and you should, you know, I'll, I'll probably be as I, present to other groups on this topic, we'll use you as an example. Um, so please keep doing that. Um, I really, really encourage you to. So thank you to the leadership, uh, Audrey and Christine and Marcy, you're doing fantastic work. And I, 
I also always love when a, a leadership is all women. That's awesome. Wait, no, no, Harlan, no offense to you, Harlan. No offense to you. I'm sure you're doing great work too. Um, all right, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sarah. That was great. Um, so let's uh, open it up here. I got I to gotta get my view back of everybody and um, get gallery view. So if people want to uh, raise their hand either mechanically or um, give a wave. I'll try to see here, but um, Marcy uh, and Christine, Suzanne, others can help me um, with this. So I see Mary um, McLeod has her hand raised. So Mary, let's you can you can start us off here. Yes, go ahead. Going back to the beginning of your talk, Sarah, um, I was always under the impression that January sixth was led by white segregationists or white nationalists rather than Christian nationalists. I've never heard that term applied to that event. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, that actually reminds me, this is something I wanted to share with you. So I think one of the things that's really important to understand is the, uh, the intersection of white supremacy and Christian nationalism. Does it mean that there are white supremacists who aren't Christian nationalists? Sure. Are there Christian nationalists who aren't white supremacists? Sure, but the overlap is huge and they they inter they are intertwined um that is actually why um i'm going to put this link here there there is a campaign called christians against christian nationalism it is coordinated by the baptist joint committee for religious liberty I'm putting the link in here now and the reason i think it's important to read their statement is because it and actually i'll, I'll just read part of it um because uh, and, and by the way, this is signed not just by a bunch of liberal uh, clergy, right? There, this is spans uh, all kinds of Christian clergy who are standing up against Christian nationalism. And you will see in their statement of principles um, that they talk about uh, how this has, what this has to do with white supremacy. Um, so, for example, uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, Christian nationalism. Sarah, Sarah, that's enough of an answer, really. I would like. To oh, okay. Know okay. I just think I do, this is why I also recommended the White Christian Privilege book because it goes into the, the historical roots of why, what, how white supremacy and Christian nationalism were always intertwined. Go ahead. Okay, thanks, Mary. Let's uh, go to Jerry. And again, others raise your hand if you uh, have a question or give a wave. Jerry. Yeah, um, first off, um, I appreciate the presentation, but of course I'll always have quibbles, that's the way I am. Uh, one quibble is with your usage of the term intersectionality. Uh, you've, you've used it almost as if, as if it's a synonym for connectedness. And quite frankly, the, the term is used much more with identities and particularly social identities. The fact that a given individual can have multiple social identities, i.e. being both black, female, lesbian, et cetera, those are all intersection, intersecting social identities. So fine, if you talk about connectedness of different issues, you're right. I just think intersectionality is it's, it's stretching the term and I, that kind of thing bothers me. But one thing you did say that I, that I really agreed with, you said individuals should bring their secular identities into their political party and activities. I agree with that. But what about the organizational side? Because I thought you talked later about organizations, secular organizations, and what should we be doing? And I think you're correct in pointing out that these organizations have traditionally been about providing a secular community for individuals, for secular people, and also um, secondarily, perhaps promoting separation of church and state. And those are good purposes, but I think you would agree that for many young people, those aren't particularly motivating. They're not hot button issues for a lot of young people. So you suggested that we should um, de develop positions on issues, and we're doing that. Uh, the things that Marcy and, and Christine do get us involved in different issues. I agree with that. But one trouble there is there are other organizations that are always more issue specific than we are. If you're into environmentalism, there's tons of other organizations that you're going to join before you join the Humanists of Minnesota to be environmentalists. So I would argue that over and beyond being involved in particular issues, Secular organizations need to develop and promote a coherent vision of a healthy society. Fundamental principles, social, economic, political principles that we would find that are consistent with humanism, consistent with secularism, and that would be the foundation for a healthy society. And the term we've used and we've adopted, a society that promotes widespread human flourishing. So I was interested in seeing how you might react to that. Um, so I do, I do think that 
ha giving a, a vision and really a, a for what it means to have a healthy society is, is not a bad thing to do mm -hmm. because I think that there's almost like a branding issue we have here where, you know, in my conversations with young people, especially when I talk to them about things like secular values and humanist values, and I use language that really uh, resonates with them, often the reaction is, I agree with everything you're saying, but I never had the way, I never had a way to express it. I didn't have the language. I didn't have the vocabulary. Um, and I think there is sort of a, a lot of, I don't think it's an accident that the unaffiliated end up oriented the way they are in large numbers on certain issues, right? So for me, for example, I, I think that uh, climate change being one of the top issues for the unaffiliated, I, just because a lot of people of faith care about the issue too, doesn't, you know, it doesn't change the fact that there's something going on with why it is so particularly important to the unaffiliated. It's actually one of, if I saw at least two polls where it showed climate change registering as a ranking as the top issue for unaffiliated uh, uh, voters and only about two other religious demographics ranked it as highly. I think it has something to do with our orientation toward the world. We only believe that there's one planet and one life and that God is not going to save us, right? That, that there's no, uh, we're, we're motivated very much by what we can do in this life. And if you, uh, if you really believe there's only one life and one world, your orientation toward climate change is going to be different, right? Um, even if people of faith end up at the same conclusion that climate is important. And so I think that appealing to the underlying reasons why, young people or you know secular people in general arrive at those conclusions is is a great way to kind of show this is a space for you like this is a place where these things that you think these perspectives that you have they have a name they have a broader agenda so i really like that idea uh, i think it's it's kind of a, a broader messaging uh strategy that we need to have um another example i mean the amount of support for medical aid and dying in secular and humanist groups is just, it's just incredibly consistent, um, especially uh, as well as reproductive rights. Well, why, why is that? Why are we so motivated by these issues? Well, it has to do with our secular and humanist orientation around bodily autonomy and how we view life, right? This, this idea of, of um, quality of life rather than sort of life at all costs, like the typical kind of Christian, um, you know, suffering sort of perspective, I think leads us to those conclusions, you know, don't tell me when and if to have a child and don't tell me how to die, right? It's really comes to, uh, I think it comes back to our orientation about our own mortality, how we view human life. Um, and those, those kinds of messages, I think are, are important, right? I, again, it's like, going beyond the surface level of like, okay, we support reproductive rights. I think getting at the why, what are the underlying values, the underlying perspective that leads people to that conclusion is a great way of saying, this is your home. This is, this is your, you know, your secular home is going to speak to you and your inherent um, perspective and ideas and values and not just sort of the surface level, like position on the issue, like you're saying. So I do think that that's a really good way of going about it. Uh, Suzanne. Hi, first of all, thanks for your um, excellent presentation. I think we can all always learn from other groups. And I was interested to hear about the Secular Student Alliance uh, presentation, which I'll definitely take a look at. Are there other groups around the country, local groups, that may be getting this formula right, or, or at least advanced enough that we could learn something from them? And then kind of a related question, are there any groups that have set up an arm, whether it's a C4 arm or a political action committee or something where they can do more partisan politics? I know the AHA has a, has a PAC, um, but have any local groups gone that route that you're aware of? That's a great question. Um... So I don't know of a local group that has a C3 and affiliated C4 or PAC, only at the national level. However, I will use one example, um, which is, um, so a few years ago, uh, one thing I uh, embarked on at the Cyclic Coalition was trying to get local groups to form regional coalitions because it is really difficult for these national organizations to mobilize the community if you, they go to a state and all the local groups are sort of 
not well networked together, right? If they're not working together. Uh, I got complaints all the time from people uh, who did speaker tours who said it was just a nightmare to go and do a speaker tour because the groups didn't all talk to each other. So rather than have one or two large co-sponsored events, they would have to go to this group to meet 15 people and this one uh, to talk to, to 20 people and it's all in the same city, right? And that's just for speaker tours, but think about what that means in terms of a disadvantage of being able to have rapid response to national and state issues. So um, one of the things that I tried to do was to get um, state or regional models uh, very similar to what the Secular Coalition does, which is, you know, have systems and structures in place so that these 19 national secular organizations, the staff know each other, they're aware of each other's programs, because you have to, you have to have a personal relationship and you have to know what each other is doing. So you can say, oh, you're doing that. Well, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Let's share these resources, right? Um, so, oh, yes, sorry. Secular AZ is, is the only, that is the only, uh, uh, example of that, uh, Secular Coalition for Arizona. Um, although I don't know that they have a C3. I think they are just a C4. So I don't think that's an example of having both. I think that's just, they have a 501C4. I could be wrong about that. They but that's have all. a 501C3, but I don't think they do much of anything. I, I, oh, maybe they, they do. Know. Okay. Then that's the one example. That's the one example. Yeah. But a lot, there's a lot of overlap. A lot of the humanists at the Phoenix Humanist Group are members or board members of there we go. Um, so that's one example. But back to the California example really quick. I want to bring it up because when you ask about, uh, it's kind of the first part of your question. I'll get to the second part of kind of are there models. Um, the one model that worked, because I tried this in three different places to try to sort of form these broader regional coalitions was in Southern California. And the reason that it's the only one that worked is because we did a retreat that was overnight. Um, the other two were a day long thing where people from all over, one was in the Carolinas and the other was in Tennessee. And this was, and again, it's California, so you, we can't all, you know, we can't, not everyone can do like a beautiful vineyard uh, type thing. But the most important thing was that we rented um, a space uh, that was tipped, that fit, had like 26 bedrooms or something ridiculous. It was like huge um, property. And during the day, we did programming, things about uh, where I brought my subject matter expertise. We had other speakers come in and, and talk about things. We had the groups introduce each other and share what they're doing that's working. But the real magic happened after the program ended when everyone's breaking bread and, and uh, having drinks. And, and by the end of it, they're on a first name basis, right? And these, are, these were all local leaders, whether it was the FFRF chapter or the humanist chapter or the SSA or the humanistic Jewish congregation. It was all the local leaders uh, or as many of them that could attend from the Southern California region. And a number of them hadn't heard of each other before. And some of them sort of knew of each other but they didn't actually have a relationship. I remember one guy there was like, you know, I've tried this before. I sent a message through Meetup and I never heard back. I said, did you call them? Did you, did you attend their meeting? I mean, that, that's not outreach, sending a meeting, is sending in, uh, something through Meetup, right? So the reason I bring this up is because that first year, the Secular Coalition gave them a grant to be able to put that together, but that was not available the next year, but they found it so valuable that they actually raised money to do it themselves the next year. And they are now a, this, I can't remember the foot, something like the Southern California uh, Coalition Leadership. It's, you know, it's, it's a C3, it's its own C3 and they still meet regularly. So now they, you know, if I was trying to get something done in Southern California, I have one coalition to go to that I know will allow me to reach all of the local secular leaders in California. Now, why is that important? Here's one thing that came out of that recently. So last year, during uh, the elections, there were a smaller group of them that they know each other, right? And they know each other's politics, and they know who's interested in the, you know, in that kind of stuff versus just the C3 stuff. So that, hey, I want to get involved in the Senate elections. You want to get involved in the Senate elections, but this is a C3. So let's go over here and do a separate event outside of the C3 called Senate. And they raised six thousand dollars in one night for the U.S. Senate races. Now, is that a lot of money in the total sum that were raised for the Senate races? No, but it is the first led partisan fundraiser that I have ever seen, and it was totally, it was totally self-initiated. 
And it came out of the C3 group and they, because they knew each other and they saw an opportunity to get involved in a partisan way together. So what I, what I think we can learn, first of all, um, forming really robust coalitions in your region, whether it's in Minneapolis or in your state with other secular and local groups is really, really important. Um, and, it, and I'm talking about going beyond co-sponsoring an event every once in a while. I mean like real personal relationships and so that you're really, really familiar on a first name basis with their leadership and their members and you understand what they're doing and you understand they understand what you're doing. And that also makes it easier for these national organizations to plug in and empower a larger group of people to do more. Um, and it also becomes a jumping off point for other kinds of activities, right? Because when you have that consistent relationship building, people start to figure out, oh, you're doing this and I'm doing this. Well, we can't do it in this space, but let's go start something else, right? Um, so that's that's the example I would, I would point to. I do want to talk about Second Coalition for Arizona for a second. Um, that is the only, not only is it the only uh, uh, C3, C4 local group, it's also the only um, secular organization that has a paid lobbyist at the state level. The only, there are lobbyists at the national level, but that's at the state level. And uh, if you, I, I would definitely encourage you to bring uh, in their board members or Tori Roberg, who's their lobbyist, to talk about how they got there. There was a lot of fundraising yeah. that happened. So you've got to do fundraising if you want to get there, but that's maybe something to aspire to. Um, you know, how much would it cost to have someone part-time or full-time lobby on behalf of the humanist community throughout the year in Minnesota, um, maybe make that a goal um, because that would be, I know that's part of uh, what they did. And then the last thing I'll say was the second part of your question um, was about, um, the, about secular Dems. So um, one thing that you can do just to get started, what, what I do when someone wants to start a caucus. So if, you're, if, you, if you heard what I was talking about with secular Dems and you thought, well, I'm involved in DFL and I really wanna, um, you know, start a caucus here. I know somebody earlier complained that they, they start with a prayer. Well, or that, so, so what I tell people when they want to start a caucus is I usually say, okay, great. Can you now, here's a sign up form, go find at least 20 to 25 other secular Democrats who would be interested in starting this, right? Um, and then once we get to a certain place where, you know, we reach a 25 goal, maybe it's 50, we do an event and they've been virtual. Uh, and the best model that I, that I can um, talk about was, it was during the election cycle is when we started the secular caucus of, uh, in Florida. And what we had was we had openly atheist and non-religious elected officials speak and we'd openly uh, non-religious candidates speak. And then we brought in the chair of the Texas, uh, sec uh, the secular Democrats of Texas and secular Democrats of Nebraska, why did we do that? Because we wanted all the people who just signed a form and said, yeah, I'm a secular Democrat. I'm kind of interested, but you know, they're not committed at that point. They just signed a form. But now they say, wow, I have elected officials in the Florida legislature who are openly non-religious and awesome. That's great. Wow, there's people who actually are brave enough to run as openly non-religious candidates in my state. That's great. And wow, we're not alone. There's already secular caucuses starting in other states. So what we do with those events is we try to use them to inspire people to run for positions so that we, from the get-go, have a chair, vice chair, secretary, treasurer that are actually going to operate just like any other caucus within the party would operate. Um, and the message is, if you want more elected officials like this, we need your support. We need a partisan space where we can help them get reelected. We can help raise their profile. Uh, we need to help candidates like this by donating to them and canvassing for them. Um, and we can join this broader movement. And yes, you can do it in Florida because look, they're doing it in Texas and Nebraska. And I'll say something about Nebraska real quick, just to show you what it means. It's like the impact you can make with a caucus like this. It's in addition to endorsing candidates and supporting them, there's another thing you can do, which is impact the culture of your party. So in Nebraska, they've been dealing with an issue where they were uh, opening their party meetings with prayer. And the Secular Caucus challenged it and tried to stop it. And it kind of became a back and forth. And they didn't get everything they wanted, but they did get them to 
uh, to make some concessions uh, so that it wasn't as, I think it was like not officially part of the agenda and it happened outside the room, something like that. But the most important thing that came out of that is that the party leadership agreed to do a sensitivity training, um, which I'm currently developing, where the leadership will be trained by the Nebraska Secular Caucus and myself as the program director of Secular Democrats of America on, on how to be inclusive of non-religious people in the party. And I'm also gonna add stuff in there about what they should understand about non-religious voters, right? The, so think about how remarkable that is of, of having an opportunity to educate and engage leadership of a democratic party in this issue. But how did it happen? Because there's Democrats on the ground who when they saw something that was exclusive, they stood up and they advocated for their own, for the secular Democrats that are their members, and they called on national leadership to provide resources. So that's the kind of impact you can have culturally as well. Thank you. Uh, I know it's not Donna. I'm sorry, Donna's Vernon. husband, I can't remember your name. Go ahead. Vernon. Okay, um, I am curious, and I will preface my question by saying that yes, I'm an atheist, uh, yes, I'm uh, way left of, uh, of center, and I vote Democrat. But my question is, as I think about the demographics of the Democratic Party nationally, um, we have a sizable segment, an important segment, that's um, in the Black community, uh, let's say people who are part of the uh, poor people's movement led by uh, Reverend Dr. Um, William Barber, and they are very Christian, at least very biblical, and th their their faith energizes and informs their political perspective and their political activity. So, as secularists, as uh, again, as uh, Sarah, as you're uh, strategizing how we develop our position, how do we relate to uh, that segment of the Democratic Party? How do we how do we um, how do we appeal to uh, the segment of the Democratic Party that is of faith? No, I'm not saying appeal. How do we live with them? How do we work with them? Well, we work with them by by um, establishing our common values. Uh, so, in my personal capacity, I serve on the DNC Interfaith Council as an open atheist, and I work with my Christian co-chair um, around the issues that matter to the party. Um, and it's really actually not that difficult. It's really just a matter of building relationships based on trust and based on showing up, right? You can't just kind of, uh, you have to understand that the party has been operating in a certain way for a very long time and um, that uh, voters of faith uh, play a really important part in the Democratic Party. Um, and so you show up for the issues that matter to the party and you make clear that you're there as a humanist and you start building relationships, right? Um, a huge part of, uh, building relationships for me has been that my co-chair can ask me questions about well, what's the right word to use here, what's the secular perspective, and I can ask her questions about uh, things that I may not know about her Christian perspective, right? But we come at it from a, from a, a, a place of what are our shared values as Democrats, um, and emphasizing those shared values helps um, to create that understanding uh, for uh, Democrats of faith um, that we, we, hey, look, we end up at the same conclusion that you do, which really reinforces the idea that yes, you can be moral without having a God, uh, you know, or believing in gods. Um, yes, we, we are actually very motivated to make our world a better place, but we come from a different perspective. So I think showing up, building relationships, the way you work is by uh, talking, uh, really focusing on values. Okay. Thanks. And, and to piggyback on that, um, Sarah, could you speak a little bit more to um, the nonpartisan sort of the advocacy work? Um, I agree with Jerry. It's very important to say like, oh, this is our worldview. This is how we view. We, I, I always say both the human flourishing part, but we want to help create the world that we, we want to live in and, and that is full of our humanist values. Um, but we're doing that oftentimes through advocacy work and there's other you know, single issue advocacy groups out there. Um, how important do you think it is to work with them? And then how, you know, and especially 
because a lot of these advocacy groups, some are um, are non are, are non sectarian. Nonetheless, they rely on, and a lot of people in them are faith based. You know, so could you speak to what it is? How do we network with people like this, and what should our role be? And and just your thoughts on this, just as if you're working within the party, if you're working on advocacy issues, and there's a lot of faith people working on those as well. Well, you know, if you if you are coming to an issue, say it's um, affordable housing, right? There's an affordable housing coalition or a group maybe that's leading on that, and maybe they approach it from a, a faith perspective where a lot of their members are of faith, right? It's the same principle. Well, you're there because you want to uh, improve um, uh, uh, upon the crisis of affordable housing, right? So that's the shared value. Like, what is it that brought us to this space? You're here because you're a person of faith. I'm here because I'm a humanist, right? You show up and you do the work, right? And, and you know, if d just as an example, so, uh, say you have someone who is um, appointed sort of a liaison from Humanist MN to some sort of issue advocacy group that has regular meetings, right? You don't go there and, and you know, the first thing you do is, is uh, you know, uh, talk about how they need to include humanists, right? The first thing you do is you just show up like any other member, right? And yes, that may mean that if they're already doing things that are faith oriented, you might have to sit through that for a while. Um, but what I would recommend is when you are going into a space that you're not leading on, you're, you're a guest, right? It's like being a guest in someone's house, right? And you're there to show up for the things that everyone is there for. And then once you show up and something, you're coming regularly, you know, you're bringing your Humanist MN members to their events, or you have this liaison that's bringing back the actions to your group, you've shown like, I'm, I'm here, I show, I am um, bringing value to this group. And along the way, you're building relationships with the leadership, with the members on a personal level beyond, uh, you know, you being a humanist, them being a person of faith, you're building a relationship as people in common cause for whatever the issue is. It's at that point where you have shown up, you have shown that you're willing to do the work, that you're, you share their values in, term, in terms of the issue. That's when you can start having um, conversations about, hey, you know, I've been coming for a while to these meetings. Uh, you know, you know, I'm really passionate about this. I'm a humanist and you guys do a lot of prayer. Can you, would it be possible for me to, to for, for that to stop or for me to provide a humanist invocation when you guys do that so that it's more inclusive? But if you did that on day one versus, you know, day 10, right, when you're, when you're at the 10th meeting, you've actually shown value, it's going to be better received. Because then it's not just like, oh, here's this person who showed up who has thing here on this issue it's oh this is audrey who i really like and who has been really helpful to us and really is cares about this issue um it, it, it becomes personal right and i i can tell you that my experience is that when i am in interfaith spaces with people that i've built relationships with their language a lot of times i don't even have to say anything their language changes their behavior changes because they know that I'm openly atheist. And all of a sudden, they have to think about something that they normally don't have to think about, right? Because they're not usually uh, in the presence of, of someone who's a, a, an atheist, right? So like I've been on a, a panel, and it's not the same as an advocacy coalition, but I've been on a panel where um, everyone else was a, a representative of a faith community. And every time they would say, uh, people of all faiths, they would say, they would look directly at me and say, and none, right? Um, and if I wasn't literally physically in that, that space, they might not have even thought of it because it's just habit. And just so that's why building these relationships and showing up goes such a long way. But just be aware that you may not be able to make those changes right away. Um, you know, especially if you're coming to an advocacy organization or advocacy space where you're following, you're not leading. Yeah, you might have to sit through some stuff that's uncomfortable for you as a non-religious person, just like you might be a guest in someone's home and um, are made to feel uncomfortable because they, they do things strangely or, you know, they, uh, you know, you don't take off your shoes in your house, but they want you to take, well, you know, it's just like you, you have to, we've all been through situations where, you know, you're in a place where you're kind of a guest. And I think that's one way to think about it. 
But once you build a relationship and you're not a guest, you're a personal friend, I've been over your house a bunch of times, or, you know, it's just kind of like that. If, if I hope that's a useful metaphor, um, you know, we need to get past our discomfort before as, as sort of guests to an issue, guests to a group before we can ask them to feel uncomfortable because it will make them uncomfortable. If they are a group that has without ever being questioned before incorporated prayer or faith into their language, their messaging, how they do their meetings, whatever, forever, and they've never been questioned before, if they do, if it's going to be uncomfortable for them to have to come to terms with that. Um, just like it's uncomfortable for anyone's privilege of any type uh, to, to, to confront that and think about, gosh, not only am I being told that um, I'm, I'm doing this thing that's wrong, that means that this whole time that I've been doing this, it's been exclusive, you know, and people can get defensive, but they won't be defensive. And they'll be a lot more open-minded if they know that you've shown up you are there for all the right reasons and you share their values um, and values meaning whatever issue is bringing you together. Well, thank you, Sarah. I think we better wrap it up. I, I let this go a little long because there was so much good stuff I thought going on here and, and um, some people have had to drop off and whoever has to drop off, go right ahead. What, thank you so much um, for speaking to us. I thought, I thought this was great. Um, and I think a lot of other people did too. But what I want to say is one of the powerful takeaways from, for me that, that I just want to end with, and I hope others um, share this, is that if we really want to promote secularism in society and in our government, and we hide our secular identities all the time, you know, that, that's just, that just doesn't compute. And people think like, oh, everyone's a Christian. It's a Christian nation, you know, like, we have to show up in spaces. I mean, maybe not be pushy about it, but I mean, we really have to be out there, out there as an organization, as a secular organization, but also as individuals. And um, it, it's, it's starting to really click in my head. <laughs> that, uh, cause I think sometimes we, we just wanna like, oh, we just wanna do it because we're, in, we know, whatever. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, we can we can just stay on and if people want to talk among themselves i'm going to let you go sarah if you if you have to anybody can go i, I was sort of we usually go to five o'clock we have some uh social time or whatever but if anyone wants to make any comments so either let's let's show our appreciation to sarah um and if you have to leave go ahead but um i'm going to hang out here till five at least uh, maybe a few minutes after and so if anyone else wants to chat or open the conversation to any further or I don't, Sarah do you have to go or <laughs> should we have I, I can probably do like a few more minutes and then I have to go okay so if anyone else has a comment or just uh, or a question to Sarah go ahead and ask or otherwise um people can make comments or whatever anyone have anything I guess not I'll take a Shot oh, at it, Audrey. Yes, Dave. Dave came in late. I see, but no, I actually I lost power on my iPad halfway through. Oh, I heard the entire okay, presentation. Maybe I missed you. Oh, okay. Except for a few minutes. So, so the the thing that struck me about Sarah's presentation, which I really appreciated and got a lot out of, was that it she strongly advocates on one side of a question that we have dithered, pondered, not really wrestled with hard, and that is are we politically active or not? And so the question of, you know, can we take these political positions, what constitutes a political position and what would constitute a violation of our charter as a 5013C? Um, I hear Sarah advocating very strongly in terms, in the direction of being active, taking positions, making statements across a broad range of, of um, issues, and not only that, organizing more broadly, not just within humanists, but through the entire non-faith community in the Twin Cities, to be even more active and more present in those areas. And so um, 
I, if, if Sarah was in our organization, I know how she would come down on that vote. It's the direction I would love for us to go. Um, but I don't feel like we have fully decided among ourselves that that's where we as an organization are committed to going. Can I make a quick comment? Um, so one thing I wanna point out as a resource is um, Boulder Advocacy, which is a program of the Alliance for Justice. They have resources on exactly what you are legally allowed to do uh, in terms of issue um, advocacy and lobbying as a 501c3. And you can actually um, schedule time with their legal experts to ask specific questions about that. Um, so here's the website for that. Um, so don't, can. Um, C3s can actually lobby, they just can't lobby, their lobbying can't be as unlimited as a, C, as a C4. Um, this is, you know, don't check out the resource and all of that, but as a general rule, you can spend up to 20% of your resources on direct lobbying. And lobbying is Tell, you know, for example, telling a legislator, vote yes or no on this legislation, right? You can do that. Educate, meeting with a legislator and just educating about the issue and about an issue, that's not lobbying. Um, that's just education, right? So a lot of the things that you might think are lobbying are not, and you actually are allowed to lobby just up to a point and it's actually quite a bit. So don't be afraid to do that if, you, if it's a legal question and the resources are there. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about, um, getting um, active and making statements and things like that um, is that if if you're if, if you're if you're worried about alienating people who aren't comfortable with that I do think it's important to to consider that like you don't have to kind of like wrench your whole organization in one organization in one direction or another um, people come to groups wanting different things um, and this is actually something I've heard American Atheists and Secular Student Alliance both have kind of the same thing. They just use a different acronym in different orders. Like uh, American Atheists calls it ACEs, and then uh, I think Secular Student Alliance calls it CASE, but they stand for more or less the same thing, which is community, advocacy, uh, social, and education. Um, and basically the theory is that you kind of have to do a little bit of everything because people are looking for different things in a group. So you need to have a place to just socialize with like-minded people. And you need to have a place to do advocacy, including political advocacy. You need to have educational programming, um, but you, and you also need to, you know, build, um, you know, community. But what happens is that you get people who join for one reason, but then they end up doing something else, right? Someone who maybe just thought they wanted to join a social group, well, all of a sudden they're, they, they see their friends who are part of the same group doing advocacy and they wanna do it with them or they're interested in the issue. Or the other way around, maybe you're gonna reach people who wanna do advocacy, aren't really interested in the social, but after they're advocating and going to the Capitol and doing all these things with their fellow humanists, they might wanna join the game night. Right? So being a well-rounded organization is a really good thing. And it doesn't necessarily have to be an either or like, well, are we gonna do this or not? There is a way to kind of just provide different things to different types of people. And I think the advantage of doing that, even though it is difficult and it's a lot to do, is that you do end up cross-pollinating and you, you end up drawing people who may not have And one example I'll use of that, I went to a Tennessee group to present on these issues. And it was probably one of the first times that they ever had a topic specifically on political advocacy. And people, sh I talked to the um, organizers afterwards, and they said, hey, a bunch of people that have never attended our meetings before, but are sort of like members on Meetup showed up to this event. And the that was kind of that's just an example of like well there's people who are were interested in their group but they just didn't want to do the social programming but they came because the people who showed up they were really politically active in sort of their other volunteer time and so this was the first time that they actually thought oh gosh this is actually something i want to come out to so that's that's something to think about is that you don't necessarily have to make it like an either or you can sort of do both and. I'll 
Sarah, we were talking about this um, right before we sort of let everyone in, I just brought it up. So I want to bring it back up because I'd be curious to hear what other people say. You can comment on what you have to say, but I'd like to hear what others in our group say. Is there starting to be, um, here in Minnesota, and I don't know if it is across the country, but here in Minnesota, there are so many advocacy, advocacy that's done through religious groups. And so it's the interfaith group. Yes, there's a lot of non-sectarian environmental groups. There's this and that and the other thing. And even those very groups, they are always reaching out to these, these faith groups because they're relatively organized. Um, and I've always struggled with wanting to be associated with this interfaith because I just, I don't know, it's not my language. It's not where I want to be. I, I feel like an outsider. I don't necessarily feel welcome, but you've, you've talked about that. But the whole idea that I've seen a little bit now, I heard it from Roy Speckart, the uh, president of AHA, and you mentioned it now um, right before we got started, or shortly before we got everyone in, is um, coalitions of conscience or, um, or communities of conscience. And while that word is not perfect either, it is so much better than interfaith or faith and um, so if you, before you go, just sort of say where you think that term is going. And then I'd love to see what other people think about participating or, gosh, I wish this could become a thing. <laughs> that you're working with people around shared values um, in communities or coalitions of conscience. Um, you know, we, our community has such a problem with language and words. I mean, I use the word secular all the time, but it's a really imperfect word. It's like, it changes depending on what you're describing. Are you describing a person? Are you describing an institution? Uh, you know, it, depending on the context, it could be non-religious or just uh, separation of church and state. So it's, it's kind of just like this forever problem that we have, I think, just because it hasn't been that long that there has been um, enough space to be openly non-religious to figure this stuff out. Um, but, uh, listen, interfaith is not a perfect word, but I do think that, um, we need to choose our battles, right? I, I would much rather us be included in interfaith environments than not, right? Um, and again, I think the more that we are involved in interfaith coalitions and building very genuine relationships that are around shared values, eventually then we can have a conversation of like, hey, could we consider renaming this coalition? But you can't do that on day one. Um, that's gonna take a while. Um, you know, that's that's the unfortunate thing about being, uh, you know, kind of the lowest on the totem pole of religious minorities, right? Like we have so much, we have this extra challenge um, that people of faith, religious minorities of faith including, um, don't have where we have to, prove ourselves to be uh, moral and, and valuable and, 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 and go from being invisible to visible. So we have to do all of that work um, and educate our counterparts of faith about who we are and just, you know, kind of dispel those misconceptions before we can even get to the other stuff. Um, so I do think it's important to just, you know, kind of sometimes you have to swallow the things that make you uncomfortable that you don't like with a long game in mind, right? If I really put a good faith, I shouldn't say good faith effort, but it, just the expression, right, of like, I'm going to show up at these interfaith meetings, and as long as they are truly inclusive of me and my community, they can use this imperfect language, but at some point, there's going to be a time where maybe you can talk about that, um, but it's not going to be day one, and I think we have to kind of accept that, because we, we just, we have bigger fish to fry the more that we can build relationships with people of faith who at least 90% of the time agree with us and we'll have our backs, right? You know, I think there's, there's certain things that I found a little, I find a little bit more valuable that I think are, are more urgent and more important. And I'm thinking about, I, I mentioned those um, retreats that I was putting together. One of them was in the Carolinas. And one thing that the local groups there were saying is that, they really have a problem with um, having members actually speak out when there are church state violations, and in particular the schools, because if you're a parent or a member of that community and it gets out in the media that you're the one challenging whatever it is, um, your kid can get bullied, 
um, you could get uh, threatened or, or just ostracized by your community. And one of the things they said is, if we only had clergy locally who would stand by us and do a TV interview with us when this comes up so that we're not just alone, it would make that it would make it a lot easier to stick their neck out, right? And I think that is actually a huge problem. I don't know how much it is in Minneapolis, but but you know, building relationships, really genuine relationships, where you give, right? You but you show up for their causes, you 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 show up to their meetings, and maybe you sit through their prayers and all that kind of stuff. But if you build a really genuine person, genuine personal relationship with clergy and people of faith who. Uh, based on trust and shared values, I think what's really valuable and what we need is we need them to stand by us when we actually stand up on these issues. Because too often, especially on, um, uh, you know, church state violations and schools and things like that, um, we're out on our own. And it would be, a, we would be able to do a lot more and make a big, bigger impact if we have people of faith next to us saying, yeah, this has to stop. We need our curriculum to be secular, right? That's why um, one thing I would recommend that Christians Against Christian Nationalism website, they have all the signers on there. Go see who signed that um, uh, uh, statement of principles who's from Minnesota because they've got clergy from all 50 states who signed it. That's a great place to start to see who our allies are. So listen, you know, I, I would, if, I, if my faith allies are gonna really stand by my side and stand up for me when I need them, that I think is the most important thing that, uh, right now that we need. And then later we can get to these kind of issues of like, okay, now can we talk about renaming the group from Interfaith to Coalition of Conscious? Or maybe now we can talk about, you know, in God we trust being our motto and why that's problematic. But you know, you gotta choose your battles. You gotta think about the long game. But the last thing I'll say about this is there are incremental things you can do. So I have been in the DNC Interfaith Council, for example, there was a recent meeting where um, we basically, there's certain things I just don't ask. It just doesn't make sense to try to eliminate in an interfaith space uh, all kinds of prayer, right? But I did ask uh, if we could have at a meeting a humanist invocation. So the beginning of the meeting had the humanist invocation and the end had a benediction. Is it perfect? Would I prefer if, for us to just, you know, not do either? Yeah, maybe, but this is much better than having zero non-religious representation, right? Um, and uh, I, I shared this before we started, um, so it's probably really far up. We'll see if I can find it again. I really encourage you all to see Joe Biden's um, proclamation on the National Day of Prayer. Do I wish we didn't have it at all? Absolutely. However, he's getting in a lot of trouble right now with the Christian right because he didn't mention God. Uh, and he's the first president to not mention God in the National Day of Prayer uh, proclamation. And in this uh, proclamation, he, while I, I would definitely imp uh, like to see it specifically uh, mention that not all uh, Americans pray, it does use the word conscience. And that's something that I have been advocating. So you can kind of make these incremental changes that do matter because I do think that at least compared to past National Day of Prayer proclamations, there are more, it's more inclusive than it was before. Does that mean it's perfect? No, but a lot of these big changes, and these are huge changes. We're challenging Christian privilege and people don't even know that Christian privilege exists. People don't know what Christian nationalism is, even though it's been around for 50 years and, and was very prominent at you know, the Capitol insurrection. There's still so much education that has to happen that, you know, to dismantle Christian privilege overnight when people don't even know that Christian privilege exists and that they might be reinforcing it, we just have to be a little bit patient and accept some incremental changes, in my view. Sarah, there's a couple other people that want to make comments, and I don't know if you can stay for them, but Suzanne and Christine, and then we'll probably have to wrap things up here. Okay, I, I'm going to change the subject just because um, one of our participants didn't have access to audio or video and asked a question that he would like uh, or ask someone to ask a question for him. Um, organizations like the Salvation Army have church religious funding behind them to get started and keep going. How are secular organizations supposed to start organizations like that? And then he, he followed up and said he would love to do that, but money is always the issue. You gotta raise money. Yeah, um, I think it's not easy, but yeah, 
um, our community is not used to asking for money. Um, and, and we have to get really comfortable asking people for money. And part of that is, you know, is, has to do with organizing, right? Um, they, we have to, there are so many non-religious people out there, but we're, the, the groups like this, uh, which provide a lot of value, are, are still not even, um, as a whole, meeting, even reaching even close to uh, the majority of the unaffiliated. The majority of people who are unaffiliated, and it's still a lot of atheists and agnostics, have no idea that groups like this exist. I can't tell you how many times I have tabled at a conference or a pride fair and the amount of people were like gosh I didn't even know that this existed I wish I had known about it before so there's there's kind of a first step I think which is before we get to the fundraising which is that we need to reach more people because you know to fundraise you need to like raise a lot of little donations from a lot of people and then in the process you also meet people of means there are secular people of means who can give bigger donations um, so part of it is the step one of like, okay, we need to reach more people, but we also need to be comfortable with fundraising. So if you have all of these committees, you've got an action committee, you've got a, you know, other, do you have a fundraising committee? Um, you know, that, that's something that needs to be part of what we do. We have to be comfortable with it. Um, and um, it needs to be a little bit professionalized, right? Um, there, there are techniques to fundraising. Um, there's ways to engage uh, people who, who give you money, and there's ways to find out who gives you $50 but could afford to give you $500, right? And you need to learn how you figure that out and how you make that ask and how you keep that person engaged and valued. That's a whole profession, right? Like there, and I'm not asking anyone, anyone to become a fundraising professional, but there are trainings that you can look into. Um, there, there's definitely, it can be done but you need to expand the pool of people you reach and you need to be comfortable asking for money. But part of it also is what we were talking about before of like that vision of the creating this idea that humanists do this stuff. Like humanists raise money for political candidates. Humanists raise money to start, uh, you know, uh, 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 th thrift stores that benefit the community. Like humanists do daycare, humanists do summer camps. Um, and by the way, we do do summer camps. If you haven't heard of Camp Quest, there is an entire organization that does summer camps uh, for, for free thinking kids, right? Um, that kind of stuff, um, maybe that's where you can start, you know, start with um, learning, you know, how to fundraise uh, for uh, the charitable secular organizations that are already out there. This foundation Beyond Belief. Um, there's Camp Quest. And you know, that, that's the last thing I'll say about this is Foundation Beyond Belief has raised a ton of money um, around causes. Um, go to their website and see their reports. I mean, they've raised a ton of money just for charitable causes. And they raise it from the secular community and then they give it to beneficiaries. So clearly, there, is, there are plenty of secular people out there who would give to a good cause. I think just like with uh, the success I've had with providing that political space for people to be secular and political, if you give people a space to be humanist or secular and helping their community like and kind of getting credit for it, you know, getting that visibility, I think a lot of people would give money to that, but you have to sort of create the space and learn how to ask. Christine. Thank you for fantastic information, Sarah. You really helped us. And uh, before Audrey jumps out of her seat to say it, we are big supporters of Camp Quest. Humanist MN is. So yeah, yeah. Uh, what, some of our board members attended it. So uh, my question was prompted by your comment on the National Day of Prayer. And it occurred to me, who do you think has the president's ear that's prompting this? What do you think? Well, um... I don't want to toot my own horn too much, but I will share with you. Um, <laughs> uh, I do not have the president's direct ear, but I do have some great relationships with some people who advise him on matters of faith, um, which is another reason why it is very important to build those kinds of relationships. Um, and I will share with you um, the, oh gosh, where is it? Uh, I'll, I'll put in the chat a link to a document that Secular Democrats of America put out um, providing um, recommendations to the administration on how they could be more inclusive of non-religious people. Um, but it's, you know, it's not like I did this personally. There's, there's been an effort over time 
Um, starting at, at, at a big moment last year was the launch of Humanists for Biden, uh, which Greg Epstein um, led. And working with Greg Epstein, we were able to talk to the Joe Biden campaign before it was uh, President Joe Biden about these issues. Um, and that, that's another great example. Greg Epstein, who is a humanist chaplain, built a relationships uh, with people like Josh Dixon, who became the faith engagement advisor or the national faith engagement director for the Biden campaign, right? So it all start somewhere along the line, not all clergy are involved in politics, but a lot of them are, right? So building relationships with the, the people who have the ear of your governor or the ear of your legislators or the ear of your council people and having personal relationships with them matters. I happen to have a personal relationship with um, the executive director of one of the state parties um, and when she was putting together a panel and needed a non-religious person to represent, she called me because she knew me and because she trusts me and she knows that I'm going to put someone forward that's not going to embarrass anyone who's going to represent us well, but also, you know, uh, make everybody comfortable, right? So that's why I can't emphasize enough why those personal relationships are really, really important because once you build that trust, you can have those conversations and then it does actually have an impact way beyond that relationship, especially if it's a mover and shaker. Well, wonderful. Um, well, we should just wrap things up. And Sarah, thanks for staying. Thank you, Sarah. And um, for everybody who, um, who stayed on the call here, um, I just found this very um, inspiring myself. Yay, thank Harlan. you so much. Nice, Harlan, we haven't heard from you. You wanna say a last word? Harlan, you want to say a last word? We have well, I, I want to thank Sarah for that wonderful presentation. Um, you know, uh, I think it really energized me <laughs> to try to get us to do more, more advocacy, secular advocacy. And, uh, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, be, you'll remain a contact for us moving forward. Absolutely. And uh, we really va would value that. So thanks so much for uh, agreeing to uh, speak to us today. We really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate all that you guys do. Um, I'm gonna head out now, but I put my email in the chat. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, or, or support. Um, if you're thinking about how to do advocacy, you know, reach out to me anytime. I'm happy to help. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye, Sarah. Bye, bye. And uh, with that, I think we'll wrap it up for the afternoon. Thanks, everyone, for coming by and. Uh, I look forward to lots of conversation within our organization about the things we heard today. So anyway, have a great evening, everyone. Great uh, rest of the weekend. So long. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.